as all of the decorations are taken down for Christmas, we uh, still gather, not just to celebrate the birth of that baby in a manger, but a baby who grew to be a man, Jesus. A man who came into this world for the appointed purpose of reconciling us with you. So help us now in this time to embrace your word for our lives. Let our hearts, hearts be open to hear uh, the truth. That Jesus is a great gift, and he gifted us with baptism, that we might be washed and renewed, that we might uh, be connected to him in life-saving faith. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of your word, the blessing of your sacraments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you know, so over the past several weeks in Advent, we were using this light and darkness motif, and if you were here for like one of my last sermons on Christmas Day, I was like, I have about uh, preached out light and darkness as much as I can, right? I mean, it doesn't get much more simple than that image of a light in this world in the midst of darkness. And when we reflect on that darkness, it can be reflected on our, in our lives in so many different ways, whether you see it in the news or whether you see it in your community or whether you see it at some way in your own life. That darkness, as I kind of reflected over the course of those weeks, is, is not always just the evil works in the world, but we see darkness as well in our lives when maybe poor health comes our way or poor mental health or the like. And we just need to see a light. We walk in this world of darkness and we need to see a light. And that's the beauty of that baby in the manger, okay? But let me say that maybe if we're going to continue to use this image, that baby in the manger was a sparkle in the midst of the darkness. Jesus had come, he was Emmanuel, God with us, but he hadn't fulfilled his purpose yet to its fullest. His mission had only begun as he became both God and man, that baby in a manger, right? So, but I always kind of like to look at it like this too. If you've ever been in a really, really, really dark place, place you know a place where you're intentionally closed off to any light whatsoever it doesn't take much just a spark for you to be able to see and make out and make sense of the room that you're in and I would say that with Jesus when that baby in the manger came into this world and you had the heavenly angels singing choruses and shepherds coming to visit and the like well truly there was a spark spark a glimmer of hope and that hope came because it was God's will God's will for this child to enter into this world and to grow to become the man that ended up as I talked about in the children's message on the cross and to escape that tomb it's a beautiful image but you know Jesus is the light and the darkness and that is the exact image that those wise men from the east came to see those magi followed a light. They followed a star that led them to, well, the home of Jesus. And he was there, and Herod intercepted them and tried to figure out who this baby was that was born a, a king unto the Jews. And Herod, feeling threatened because he was the king over all the Jews, wanted all these children, all these young boys to be martyred, what we call the martyr of the innocents in church history. But Jesus, well, Joseph, his earthly father, was warned in a dream to go to Egypt. And so they did, escaping the hand of Herod. But see, epiphany, that word in and of itself, doesn't an epiphany, when I hear that word, and if I have to put an image to it, a lot of times it's like a light bulb over a head, right? Boop, the light went on, you know? And that's an epiphany moment. And certainly we celebrate the fact that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we just sang, is placed on our hearts life-saving faith in Jesus, the true Son of God. Yep, came in and was born a baby, he was in a manger, but now he's a man. We're like, you know, just a few weeks out here, and Jesus has grown. And we see in Mark's gospel, uh, we don't see the whole birth narrative, Right? He just begins by mentioning Jesus and then going straight to John. 
And John's gospel does the same thing. Now, John the baptizer is not the same as the disciple uh, John, but the disciple, or the apostle John, wrote this book then as a testimony to John the baptizer's work as well. And they both go straight to these baptismal waters. Why did these writers do this when Mark, or Matthew and Luke gave the whole birth narrative? Well, they had a different audience. They had a different goal. They wanted to go straight to the point and help us see the reason that Jesus came into this world. As a matter of fact, if I look at John's gospel, when we talk about this light and darkness, he plays it out so beautifully as he enters into Jesus' baptism. He writes, In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness, to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Wow. Well, if you look at Mark's gospel and you look at John's gospel too, the primary character in this moment isn't Jesus. It's John, the baptizer. Why? Well, I guess we'll step back into Advent again and say because John's mission and ministry was all about preparing people for the coming of Jesus into this world. That was his mission, to prepare straight the paths for the Lord, right? And he did it through preaching and through a baptism of repentance. A baptism of repentance. Now, if you're going to repent, you've got to lay some groundwork here because if you're going to repent, it already assumes that you know you're a sinner in need of God's forgiveness. And one of the things that most fascinates me, I did a lot of reading this past week about cultures that don't understand the concept of sin. And I've heard about it before and I decided to do some reading. And it is amazing because there are cultures that don't understand the concept of sin. Now, don't get me wrong, they have what you might call cultural standards and moral obligations in some regards, but sometimes they don't stand in light of what God's word would tell us as well. So John is preaching a baptism of repentance. It assumes that these people know they're sinners. But we have to understand that in our world and even in the culture we live in, that's just not always the case. People don't under always understand they're sinners because maybe they don't believe in any God. So really, they just live by a moral standard that's set forth by society. I read one article about a missionary that was in a, 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 a primitive community, and he had to, you know, preach the gospel, and a lot of people had come to faith in Jesus Christ, it appeared, but he was frustrated because their lifestyles weren't changing. Okay, now, this missionary was working through this mindset that, you know, all I have to do is tell them what the Word of God says, and they're going to do what he says. But they couldn't understand, because why? In their culture, polygamy had been acceptable from the onset of their, their culture, right? And not only uh, polygamy, but it, it was kind of interesting. One of the things they didn't uh, like at all was any expression of anger or frustration. That was taboo in their culture. Well, you can imagine that this missionary, the more he preached about, uh, you know, monogamy and, and uh, that God intends us, for, for, to be, us to be with one mate and da 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 and the more they just kind of looked at him and said, that doesn't make any sense, the more he got frustrated. Now they're looking at him as a sinner because he's frustrated with them the more he preaches. And it was a never-ending cycle to doom, Right? Not all people see their need for repentance. But God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, has placed the truth of his word on our hearts, and we know our need for forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a hard thing to think that there are people in this world that don't think they need God to forgive them. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like maybe the world we live in today to a large degree? So the question is then, do we go out and do we proclaim God's word the way this guy did through anger and frustration? 
And where is that going to get us? Or do we proclaim the truth in love? What's the motivation of our hearts? I want to tell you, I, uh, I went online because I tried to think of uh, a ministry, Christian ministry, uh, that was doing it all wrong. And maybe if I was to quiz you right now, I know a number of you probably would come up with the same church. And it's called Westboro Baptist Church. Anybody got heads nodding out here? Do you know who they are? This is the church that finds it justifiable to go to the funeral of soldiers that have died in the line of duty in service to our country. And they hold placards that say that God is happy that another soldier is dead. It's sad. And they all do all supposedly in the name of Christ. Why? Because they believe that throwing the truth out there and throwing the book of the law in these people's faces is going to turn them to their need for a Savior. They've got it all wrong. As a matter of fact, I went on, as I continued to read more about them and what they were all about, they talked about how if you go to a church that talks and tells you that Jesus died for the sins of all people, they're proclaiming a lie. He only died for those who repent. They got it all wrong. And it's unfortunate that people who go forth maybe with good intentions but do it in such a wrong way are turning people away from life-saving faith in Jesus Christ. There's a right way and a wrong way. People flock, flock to one and maybe not another. See, because Paul writes in Ephesians that we're to speak the truth in love. And I believe that's what John the baptizer was doing. Let's go back to those waters of the Jordan. John the baptizer is there and he's baptizing people with a baptism of repentance. So he had people that knew they were sinners that need to be made right before God. And John was doing it all right. Perhaps they knew that well, God's love was upon them, John's love was upon them, but he was still going to speak the truth. We need to repent. And people came. And as a matter of fact, the word tells us that people from all of Jerusalem and Judea were coming to see him. Now, it could be hyperbole, but let's just say there's a lot of people. And why should we be surprised, right? Something good was happening there, and people were going to see it. All right? I looked it up today, and it, it, it was kind of funny. Uh, I saw somebody in a note mention, why should we be surprised that uh, John the Baptizer had so many people come in when we can go to YouTube and watch a squirrel skiing, water skiing? And I did. I went on the YouTube video, and I bet you could never guess how many people have watched this one video of a squirrel water skiing. 2.7 million people, okay? 2.7. So if 2.7 million people will watch a video of a of squirrel water skin, why wouldn't we have people flocking to hear the truth of God's word, a preaching of repentance of our sin and our need of a Savior? And that's John's mission. And that's what John brought to, well, the world of that time, but he brought that to us as well. We need to hear. We need a Savior. And his name's Jesus. Now Mark then shifts gears immediately because Jesus comes onto the scene and he's baptized and the rest of his gospel, it's all about Jesus. As a matter of fact, the subtitles in this Bible, I just thought the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, Jesus begins his ministry, Jesus calls the first disciple, Jesus heals a man with an unclean spirit, Jesus heals many, Jesus cleanses a leper, Jesus heals a paralytic, and it goes on and on and on. See, Jesus in this moment, at his baptism, was beginning his work of saving you and me and all who call upon his name. Why was he standing in that water to begin with? If Jesus was perfect, why did he need a baptism of repentance? Well, it's really not that hard of a question to answer, is it? Why did Jesus die on the cross for you and me? Whose sins did he carry to the cross? As a matter of fact, God's word tells us that he who knew, who knew no sin became sin for us. And Jesus, even in those waters and the baptism of repentance, 
was beginning his ministry of reconciling us to our Heavenly Father. You might say our sins were with him in those baptismal waters. And isn't it a beautiful thing to see in that moment? The heavens were torn open. The Greek word is really that violent. They were ripped open as the Holy Spirit descended and our Heavenly Father said, This is my beloved Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And in that moment, the crowds, the crowds that went to John's baptism that day, they didn't know what to expect, but they received a great and glorious gift in that moment. And we received yet another gift as well. See, because Jesus, as he carried our sins to the cross, died for us, and as he rose from the tomb to give us the promise of eternal life, knew that we would walk in this world as well. You know, our Heavenly Father, you might say, was proud of Jesus. We see in the scriptures that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor before men and before God and the like. And he wants us to grow as well. And one of the gifts he's given us is the gift of baptism. That we might be washed in the waters of baptism. Not a baptism of repentance, but as John the baptizer said, he'll wash you with the water of a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus says in Matthew 28 to the disciples, Go therefore and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and to teach them to obey the things I've commanded you and lo, I will be with you to the very end of the age. When we look at the blessing and benefit of baptism, we see in Acts chapter 2 when Peter is preaching a sermon to the very people that were yelling, Crucify him, crucify him in Pontius Pilate's courtyard. And he preached a sermon that cut them to the heart. And they said, what do we do? And he says, repent. Wow, same thing as John the baptizer. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for all in your household. Yet another gift is given us by Jesus. And then Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, which was read for you earlier. Reflect on your baptism as you hear this word and what a beautiful thing it is to be connected to Jesus' death and resurrection through this life-saving gift. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who's died has been, born, has been set free from sin. Now if we've also died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, the life he lives, he lives to God. So, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. My friends, we've received yet another gift. Didn't stop with a baby in a manger didn't stop even with Jesus dying on the cross or rising from the tomb. But he's blessed us with his word and his sacrament, the gift of baptism and the Lord's Supper, that we might be strengthened for new life connected to Jesus, for our forgiveness and life everlasting. Leave this place today knowing in all assurance that you're a forgiven sinner. God loves you dearly. I'm pretty sure he's got a photo album with you somewhere. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord.